Hello and welcome to the, another episode of Meet the Author Live. I'm your host, John Saunders. Great to see you. This is an opportunity to learn everything there is useful to know about authors. Uh, and as we go through the introduction here, please drop in the chat where you're joining us from. It's always fun to see where our listeners are from. Uh, judged on the uh, looking at the over 800 of you that signed up for today. Uh, we've got people from all over the world, it looks like. So great to see that. Uh, super excited about that. So yeah, drop a little note in there uh, where you're joining us from in the chat. Uh, so today with me, third time author, Mark Graben, who is publishing The Mistakes That Make Us, Cultivating a Culture of Learning and Innovation. Uh, you can pre-order his book, his ebook now for $2.99 for a limited time on Amazon. And the official release will be out uh, next week. Is that right? Tuesday. Over to yeah. the 27th. Excellent. Uh, the Mistakes That Make Us, already a number one bestseller on Amazon. Uh, it's not even, it's still only the pre-sale mode. That yeah. is incredible. And you can also get a pre-order, uh, a signed copy of it, right, from your website? They can, paperback or hardcover. That'll be available a couple of weeks later, but um, coming now, I guess I'll say in July. Yeah, That's awesome. And so you can, yeah, on Mark's uh, website, mistakesbook.com forward slash shop. And you can use LinkedIn, all caps, LinkedIn Live uh, to get free shipping on that signed copy. So that is super cool. Yeah, put, uh, put that in as a, a coupon code when it prompts you. Perfect. And also, uh, we're doing a raffle here, and I'll drop these links in the chat here in just a minute, where Mark's going to give away a few of his ebooks uh, through a raffle. But just a little bit of a more background on Mark, really interesting background. So as I said, author, speaker, podcaster, over 250, 15 episodes on the show. It's amazing. Uh, Mark serves as a consultant through his company, Constancy Inc., and is a senior advisor for the technology company, Kai Nexus. Uh, he got his BS in industrial engineering from Northwestern and both an MS in mechanical engineering and an MBA from MIT, uh, leading for global leaders program. Uh, he has over 518,000 followers on LinkedIn, has hosted, as I said, 215 episodes of his flagship show, My Favorite Mistake. There we go. I have one of those coffee mugs, buddy. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I was a guest on the show last year. Um, and uh, Mark's had guests such as Daniel Pink, Shark Tank's Kevin Harrington, and two sitting members of Congress, and many, many more. Mark, great to see you. Thanks for jumping on an episode here. Yeah, John, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for putting this together. Thanks again for sharing your favorite mistake on the podcast. That was great. It, uh, it you know, I appreciate the exercise. It, I think it's an important one for all of us to just think about what that favorite mistake is. So I really appreciate that you put that out there as you know one of your yeah. opening uh, comment or your opening question. Yeah. And holy cow, uh, the chat I just jumped in there has already lit up. We've got uh, nice. people from all over the place: Dubai, Detroit. Uh, there's a uh, Maxime from Maxim from Det uh, uh, Dubai. We've got someone in Detroit, uh, Nafis from across the river for me here in uh, the DC area. Yeah. Uh, boy, we've got people calling in from all over the place already. Thank you all for joining. Oh, we've got someone really, uh, staying up late to hear your story from India, right? What it's uh, getting a little late over there. Uh, -huh. uh Philadelphia. Oh, it's got a, a note here from Lee. Um, uh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah. And one of your neighbors here in Kentucky. Hi, Bill. Uh, I love it. Oh, and there's Doug. Know your face is here. This is great. Uh, Mark, uh, Doug is loving your title there. Holy cow. This thing is uh, lighting up here. Uh, oh, so good. Well, great to see you all. Thanks for joining in. Uh, so, Mark, let's let's jump into it here, buddy. Sure. How does it feel to have your third book out there? No less a number one top seller at Amazon already. It's, it's both exciting and I'll admit it's scary, <laughs> right? I mean, just um, of... of, of throwing a book out into the world. I mean, as, as I was writing, I mean, I was working with an editor. I was working with a book coach. Hi, Tom. Hi, Kathy. You know, I was getting feedback from a lot of people in the way, which, which helps me feel more confident about the book. But, you know, you just hope it is, is it resonates with people, you know, not just that, that people read it, but that it's helpful. Because, I mean, this is a topic that I care deeply about. And there's just always that risk of putting something out there, of, you know, you hope most people are going to like it. Um, there's somebody, you know, somebody inevitably won't like it, but I hope, you know, you always hope at least the first review that comes in is a five-star review, not, um, not one of the people who doesn't like it. But that's, that's part of, I guess, just what's scary about anytime you put a video out or you write something or put yourself out there. Look, I'm, I'm open to the feedback, but you know, it's still, you know, it's still a little scary of, you know, you, you hope, something that you produce uh, is helpful and appreciated. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite exercises, uh, Mark, especially working with authors and anyone who's creating stuff and coaching them, if they feel sort of this 
uncertainty as you're feeling is I'll take them to like pick your favorite author that's, you know, super well-known Simon Sinek or whatever. And you can sort their reviews on Amazon yeah. by up you know, by five star or by one star. <laughs> so that's, even, you know, some of the most famous authors, that's, authors that's, in the world have one star. That's like, a good reminder. Yeah. And not just one, one star review. They'll have mm -hmm. like dozens and dozens and dozens of them. So yeah, that, that's awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And yeah. so vulnerably. Mm -hmm. uh, so the mistakes that make us, Mark, what, what drove you to write this book? What's your why behind it? Well, I think for one, there's that, you know, that passion around the idea of um, learning from mistakes. And you know, after doing the My Favorite Mistake podcast for a while, you know, there's just this accumulation of stories that, that people would share um, about, you know, kind of the individual growth that can come from really kind of like building upon a mistake, capitalizing on a mistake, turning it into a positive I find that really inspiring and, you know, and, and the guests who are sharing those stories, I think, set a great example and, and provide great reminders to, to all of us. That, look, we all make mistakes. Maybe what we have control over is how we react to those mistakes. And, and then I think there were great examples from a lot of guests, of, you know, whether they were business founders or CEOs or leaders in different levels of how they're trying to cultivate that culture within, within their company. Because, you know, I think you know, come all other things being equal, um, companies that are better at learning from mistakes are going to outperform those who aren't doing that. So it's, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of passion, a lot of excitement that I'm um, really kind of built from you know the, the the gift that my podcast guests gave me of their stories and and their vulnerability. So so interesting, and I love uh, listening to everyone's mistakes and how they just share them so vulnerably. So. <laughs> You know, as, as you sort of look across your life's journey and you know, these hundreds of people you've interviewed and, and you know, your own experiences, uh, you know, why, why, why have these mistakes become so important to you, you think? Well, I mean, there, there's all kinds of different mistakes that, that we make and run across. I mean, there's some mistakes that really just don't have any big uh, impact on anything. We might still have to, you know, kind of fight the instinct to, um, you know, be hard on ourselves. So, like, okay, well, we made a mistake. One question we can ask is, well, you know, what was the impact um, and, and, and try to figure out um, how we can learn if needed instead of, you know, just beating ourselves up. There are some mistakes that, that have a big impact. And I think especially as I've worked in healthcare a lot since 2005, you know, you see too many cases where, where individuals, whether it's nurses or doctors or whatever their role is, they get blamed, I think, unfairly, unjustly for systemic mistakes. Um, and the impact of this can, can be really um, dire in, in healthcare. I mean, you know, mistakes can lead to um, harm or, or, or death. And, you know, I think organizations that have realized that, um, well, we, well, while we can work to prevent certain types of human error, when it occurs, it's, it's counterproductive when, when leaders react in like really punitive or blaming ways, because all that does is sort of drive people to be more clever, more creative about how they hide or cover up mistakes. And then, you know, if that's happening, we, we certainly can't learn from them in a way that prevents um, mistakes or, or bad outcomes in the future. Gosh, it really makes me think of uh, uh, some of the most catastrophic things we've experienced in sort of human history, particularly in the last 20 years, I think of the 08 recession, right? Mm -hmm. Sort of the financial services industry was kind of covering up some of the mistakes they were making with lending as an example, right? Yeah. And yeah. Br brushing it out of the rug and what happened at the or back of that. Or you look at, you know, famous disasters like the Challenger um, disaster or, you know, other other things even happening um, recently. There, there's, there's a pattern sometimes where, um, you know, a leader or a founder of an organization doesn't listen to the technical experts who work for them. You know, sometimes uh, um, there's, there's a catastrophe that's sort of driven by a mistake or a series of mistakes. And somebody might say, oh, you know, who, who could have seen that coming? But a lot of times leaders weren't listening to the people who did see it coming, or at least, you know, were highlighting the risks. And, and I think that's an important part of, of uh, an organization's culture. One, one that would be healthy and successful is, um, for, for leaders to respect and listen to technical experts or people on their team who are trying to raise concerns about possible mistakes, um, especially, again, in circumstances where the impact of the mistake, where we could ask, what's the worst that could happen, right? It's one thing to make a mistake with 
oh, a marketing campaign and you use a tagline that doesn't resonate with people, like that's not a mistake to be overly scared of. But, you know, there, there are certain situations where we, we do have to be really mindful of, of thinking, uh, you know, how do we prevent mistakes? How do we reduce or mitigate the risk of mistakes when, when that impact, um, you know, could be really severe? Yeah, you make such a great point there. And, you know, I, I have certainly found in my coaching and career on Wall Street over the years that challenges, opportunities, mistakes, right? They're all pretty well known around the enterprise, mm -hmm. but you've got to give people the, uh, empower them to bring that to the forefront. And not everybody does that. So how as a coach and consultant, Mark, how do you help coach leaders to deal with that and to, to bring it out in the open? Well, I mean, I think for one, I mean, there's this question of, you know, how do we help people bring um, you know, concerns or uh, problems or mistakes um, forward. Um, and, 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 you know, part of that is creating an environment where, where people feel safe or where they feel the, a level of psychological safety, where they feel safe to admit uh, a mistake because they know the organization and, the, and their leaders and their colleagues are going to respond in a constructive way, you know, of looking at understanding why, a mistake occurred instead of asking who messed up. And we kind of try to understand causes or root causes of mistakes. Um, we, we need to channel that into um, understanding and learning and, and problem solving and, and prevention. So there's some organizations that I highlight in the book um, that I think have a really good uh, culture in that regard. You know, one is, you know, a large famous company, um, Toyota, that a lot of people have written about. It's a company I've studied and learned, for, from, uh, learned from a lot over 25 plus years, where generally in their stories in the book from Toyota people about leaders reacting um, constructively in a non-punitive but helpful way. And then, um, you know, company, and you mentioned, and I'm wearing their logo on my shirt here, a software company, Kinexus, a 12-year-old tech company in, in Austin, Texas. There's a lot of stories in the book that illustrate you know, kind of the intentional effort of leaders to to lead by example in terms of admitting mistakes and not trying to pretend like they're perfect and all knowing, um, you know, encouraging and, and rewarding people who admit mistakes, again, for the purposes of learning, not for shaming them or blaming them or ridiculing them. You know, there, there's this healthy culture of, of sharing mistakes. And especially when you have opportunities to share small mistakes that again, allow you to learn and improve in ways that prevent something that would be uh, a more catastrophic mistake. So those are a couple of things I sort of try to help educate or coach leaders through of building these habits that, um, you know, create this foundation of psychological safety that allows people to then speak up about mistakes. So then we can not just be, you know, nice or say like, oh, I know you didn't mean to do that, John. It's okay. Well, like that, that's maybe that's, that's nicer you know, being nice is better than being punitive, but I think being kind is, is, is constructive, right? So we're going to take action of not just saying, John, it's okay, because you don't want to be nice over and over again when mistakes are being repeated. I think a kind reaction helps people understand um, how, you know, why the mistake occurred and, and what we can at least test some things and try to figure out how to prevent recurrence of, of that mistake. I think that's the kindest thing that we can do. So, so important. And, you know, there's so many great lessons in there, but really it's about sort of is making mistakes accessible and okay and empowering people to take them because then they're taking risks and growing and finding out better ways to do things and execute, right? Mm -hmm. And you talk a little bit in the book about, you know, event, uh, ideas around mistakes that should be prevented and mm -hmm. celebrated. Can you talk to mm -hmm. us a little bit about that? And I'm going to share as you share this story, uh, the chat is lighting up. I'm going to share a few okay. more of our, our callers in here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there, there are different situations and different types of mistakes. And I'll, I'll point and give a hat tip to um, Amy Edmondson from Harvard Business School, who's um, written a lot of great stuff on psychological safety. And I've learned from her, you know, and she kind of categorizes there are different situations and types of mistakes. So at the one end are mistakes that happen when we're trying new things, when we're being innovative and creative and maybe the risk uh, of, of a mistake is, is sort of low. If we're working to create new software or new marketing campaigns or things that aren't a matter of life or death, um, we can't know in advance what is going to be perfectly successful. So we need 
to, to think in terms of testing ideas and iterating and learning from mistakes as we go. And, and again, like expecting mistakes, if not celebrating them. But then I agree with Professor Edmondson at the other end of the spectrum, there's a category of mistakes that would really come from, let's say, routine operations. Um, you know, we, we should know or we do know how to prevent these mistakes. Things like uh, I'll, I'll point to healthcare examples again, medication errors, uh, wrong side or wrong site surgeries. Those are mistakes that, you know, that are preventable. You know, we, we know if we do the right things the right way we can in the right culture, we can prevent those mistakes. So I, 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 I'm not trying to encourage people to be flippant about mistakes. There are certain mistakes that are preventable and would have a big impact. We need to work really hard, you know, in a diligent and disciplined way to prevent them. That said, because the world is complicated and, and human error occurs because we are human, none of us are perfect. We're all going to make mistakes, especially when we're fatigued or distracted or, you know, there are systemic um, factors there. Mistakes are still going to happen. And then there's that middle category that Edmondson talks about of, you know, kind of new, a new combination of circumstances that, oh, we just didn't anticipate. We didn't think that kind of mistake was possible. Um, you know, those are all mistakes to learn from. And even when we're preventing mistakes or focusing on preventing mistakes, I think we have to be really careful to not react to the ones that happen in a punitive way. Because again, we want to be kind and constructive. We want to focus on learning and improvement and prevention. When the focus is on, you know, what we often hear described in healthcare as naming, blaming, and shaming. <laughs> like, again, that just, that drives people to hide and cover up mistakes when they can. And then, you know, we lose opportunities to learn and we're, we're bound to have more mistakes. So there's this sort of counterintuitive thing where if leaders think punishing mistakes is the way to drive down the number of mistakes, I just don't. I don't think it works that way. You Doesn't. might have fewer reported mistakes <laughs> because people are scared. And that's different than actually reducing the number of mistakes that happen. Uh, unbelievable, right? And it, when you you get the exact opposite of what you're hoping for when you mm -hmm. make it punitive, right? You mm -hmm. you get people to take less risk, to, to hide mistakes, and then yeah. bigger problems can surface, right? Yeah. Somebody mentioned the BP disaster in here uh, um, from a little while in the chat here. Thank you. Yeah. I got to tell you, Mark, this may be the most global audience I've ever seen. We've got like a dozen people from Africa chiming in here, Europe, right. all over the US, uh, Dubai, mm -hmm. Middle East, uh, all over the place. So thank you very much, everyone, yeah. for chiming in here. Quite a global thank audience you. you have, buddy. Uh, so when you think about the mistakes that make us, and by the way, for our listeners, we're going to jump to the rapid fire segment here in a couple of minutes, and then we'll uh, open up your questions if we have time at the end. So if you do have questions, by all means, drop them in the chat. Uh, so Mark, when you think about the mistakes that make us, you know, what do you really hope re uh, readers take away? Well, I think, you know, one is to understand the importance of what people call psychological safety. Um, instead of telling people or lecturing them or even encouraging them to speak up. You should speak up. You know, you should feel safe to admit your mistakes. Like you can say that. It doesn't mean people will feel safe speaking up about uh, mistakes. So, you know, instead of telling people to be brave, we need to reduce the risk that people face when it comes to speaking up about mistakes and, and other things. It's, um, you know, I think when, when people, and we all find ourselves in a situation of like, should I speak up or not? Like, what's the benefit of speaking up versus the risk? Um, you know, when 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 people choose not to speak up, you know, uh, or, or when they do choose to speak up, I, I think I've come to to learn it's it's not a matter of character or courage. You know, it's a function of culture, right? So I think instead of telling people you need to to speak up, leaders can do things to to reduce the fear factor and and help people. Um, feel safe enough to admit a mistake. And then when they do, as a leader, you need to give them, you know, that kind and constructive response instead of one that's punishing and punitive. Right. This is how we learn and how we grow. Uh, and as I said, Mark's book is available now. You can go out and get it on Amazon. The pre-sale will be out next week. Special price, $2.99 for a limited time here. So go out and get your copy today. Uh -huh. uh, looks like we've got some demand for your mug already here, buddy, from Dennis. Uh <laughs> Dennis, yeah. Dennis is an old friend of mine from my hometown. I'll send you a mug, man. Yeah, uh, thank you for being here. 
That's awesome. Uh, I did just drop the Amazon link in there. If anybody wants to order Mark's book today, can't recommend it enough. I've really enjoyed it. I'm already into chapter four or five, I think. Also drop Mark's podcast in the link here. If you want to be a, uh, go ahead and subscribe to Mark's podcast out there. It is a fantastic show. Uh, let's keep going. What do you think you learned from writing the book, buddy? I feel like there's always learning oh. as we write books. What, yeah, what yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's the book you set out to write and then there's the book you end up writing. And, and I think one thing I learned was, you know, well I had opportunities to sort of try to practice what I'm preaching. Um, you know, for one, like, you know, being kind to myself, if I've made what I thought were mistakes and how I structured the book and I decided to, you know, adjust and throw some material out and restructure and rewrite, like I, that's, I think that that's, that happens, right? So to, to accept that as part of the writing process and to embrace that, um, you know, I think I've learned, you know, chapter seven in the book is about iterating your way to success. You know, I think the process of writing a book um, can, can be a, an iterative process instead of like just, you know, it's, you know it's, it's thinking of a book like a startup and, and the modern startup or lean startup approaches encourage entrepreneurs don't go into stealth mode. Don't go into hiding and, you know, work for years in secrecy on some piece of software that you think is perfect. Like, no, you need to get something out there and you need to get feedback and, and test your ideas and, um, and realize, okay, it's not going to be perfect. So, you know, get input and it's not a matter of, you know, just finding typos, but, you know, getting input about readability and what resonates and, and, and taking some of that feedback, but, you know, I think, again, maybe on advice to other authors, you're going to take in feedback, but ultimately the book is yours. You know, you've got to decide if you whether it's conflicting feedback or or feedback you might not agree with. I mean, it's your name on the cover. So I think ultimately sometimes like, yeah, you have to accept feedback, but sometimes you, you just need to say, OK, I'm going to stay true to this vision here. Right or wrong. It's on me. Well, I, I was an honor for me to be one of your beta readers. And thank you for giving me an early access to the book. I've really enjoyed reading it, it so was, far. It was very, it was very helpful. Oh, thank you. Uh, so right, being kind, how can we be kind to others if we can't be kind to ourselves, right? So I really appreciate you putting that message out there to the world. It's so, so important, yeah. uh, particularly as you go through something as vulnerable as putting out a creation to the world. Uh, yeah. I will never forget the moment I announced my book to the world just a few years ago now, but I, I was riddled with just anxiety saying, oh my gosh, I'm doing this thing. And it wasn't even done yet. It was nuts. So it's, yeah. it's, it's a tricky one. And you've done it three times now. Uh, for those who are maybe even thinking about writing a book, Mark, how the heck did you fit it in your life? Uh, it, it's a challenge sometimes. I mean, I think every time I've written a book, um, you, you've got to make certain sacrifices. Like the first time I wrote my uh, a book, Lean Hospitals, in, in 2007 was when I was doing the writing, fall of 2007. I, I you know, my wife was encouraging in terms of like, you know, you've got to make time. Um, I, I didn't wa watch a lot of uh, football that year. Like I watched my Northwestern Wildcats and that was pretty much it. I said, like, I need to use weekend time uh, to write because, you know, the, the writing has never been a full time job for me. Um, so sometimes, yeah, I mean, whether you ask it yourself or you get that loving, challenging question from 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 a spouse of like, okay, what are you going to do to make time? Right. Instead of saying, I don't have time, you need to kind of flip the equation and ask yourself what you're going to do. Um, to, to, to make time. Um, I, I did, as I was working on the book last year, kind of draw a line in, in the sand in November. Uh, I, I decided I was going to take a week of PTO um, just for book time. Like I, I canceled all, all standing meetings. I blocked off my calendar. I told people I'm working with, like, I'm really just like, I'm, I'm basically on vacation this week. And, and being self-employed, um, you know, I, 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 I can do that. And um, that, that was really helpful. But that was a luxury. A lot of times you have to just kind of figure out how to fit it in. Right. I know one of the things I found with me is I was strangely found myself being hyper productive in my book late at night. So I would write from like yeah. 9 p.m. And I needed the silence. So I'd wait for my kids mm -hmm. to go to bed. I'd write from nine, oftentimes to one, two in the morning. And yeah. it's crazy when you get in the zone. Yeah. Man, there were nights where I had to shut, just oh. cut myself off, even though I was still getting after it at two in the morning. You, you have to get into that that flow state where like you can't say like, oh, I've got 45 minutes between meetings. I'll do some <laughs> writing. Like I think you really you need to carve out blocks of time and kind of you know, mentally get get your head into the book. So, so important. 
So uh, we're, we're, we're winding down here and getting close to the rapid fire questions, Mark. Goals for 2023, buddy, now that you got this book out here coming well, next week. Yeah, I mean, uh, getting the ebook out, getting the print books out over um, the finish line with you know the, the great business partners that I'm working with here um, to get that done. Um, I'm going to record the audio book in July. I think that will be available for release in the fall. And then, you know, I'm hoping the book will help open um, opportunities for more speaking engagements or, or coaching opportunities um, with different organizations. And you know, on the psychological safety front, um, I've, I've been certified um, through an organization called Leader Factor, where there's a psychological safety assessment that um, I'm certified and in, in, in licensed. You know, I can license that from leader factors. So if people want to answer that question of like, well, what is our level of psychological safety? We can measure that. We can look at the baseline and we can do some things as leaders to help improve that perception of psychological safety. I love it. And if you want to learn more about Mark, I dropped his website in the chat here. It's on the screen, markgraben.com. And uh, you can follow him or connect with him on LinkedIn at M Graben, easy man to find out there. Uh, so my favorite question here, buddy, what is your favorite mistake? Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's a very subjective question, right? What do you mean by favorite? Um, so my, well, the one story I often tell is when, uh, back in about 2004, when I was working at Honeywell, the last manufacturing company I worked with, the long story short of it is, you know, I was, um, being certified, um, as, uh, you know, basically a lean black belt, if you will. And I had to go do this project and, I, my mistake was not fully engaging the frontline production associates as much as I should have. Now, some of that was a function of culture. Like it wasn't a culture that would allow us to stop production and really spend time engaging the people who were doing the work. You had to find little moments here and there. So some of it was systemic, but still, you know, I kind of take ownership for, you know, um, my actions. I should have pushed harder to more fully engage the people doing the work because you know, we put together um, some, some technical improvements that, that basically weren't adopted. I think not because they were the wrong solution, but it was this change management lesson around when you don't fully in, in involve people, um, it's hard to get them to buy in and commit to a solution that they're not really a part of creating. So I part of the lesson learned, like, even as a consultant, is to not allow myself to be in a position where a client wants me to come in and fix things, but we don't have time to engage the frontline staff. Like that's the type of situation that, that I would say, no, no, thanks. Good luck to, um, cause it just, it doesn't work. And, and, you know, there was, there was a lesson learned. Um, I took the lesson from it. There was a, probably a cost to Honeywell because, um, you know, that, that improvement, I think really would have been an improvement. It didn't, it didn't really stick. So there was some, some business, a little bit of business harm that, that resulted and, Hopefully they've learned and figured out things like that over time. Thankfully, I think I did individually. Well, isn't that a great lesson though, to think about you can't, if companies, if there's things happening, maybe some structural holes, you can't just sort of go work on one part of the business, right? Oftentimes it's yeah. going to impact lots of people and you've got to get them involved to get their buy-in. Uh, let's jump into a couple of questions in the chat here. If we could maybe try yeah. to do these quickly here. And, but and if, we, and if we run out of time, I'll come back and respond to other questions um, as replies. We have a question here from a uh, recent author, Doug Shear and Columbia professor. Yeah. I'm seeing dissonance in the age of agile where the organizational statement is failure is not an mm -hmm. option. While at the same time, promoting and formalizing <laughs> the lessons learned, uh, what would you say to an organization that uh, doesn't allow this idea uh, uh, well, of the smallest miss? I mean, you know, it's a famous expression and, and I get the spirit of it from, you know, kind of the NASA space exploration story. But I think it's really dysfunctional when organizations say things like, you know, failure is not an option. Um, one of my guests and somebody I really, really um, respect and admire, Rich Sheridan, he's the CEO of a, a software company in, in Ann Arbor called Menlo Innovations. You know, when we talk about running experiments and, and Rich said it so well, uh, his episode's coming out soon. He said, if, if, you all, if your experiments are always successes, you're not really running experiments, right? So we don't want to have, you know, improvement theater or experiment theater or <laughs> agile theater where we're just saying certain things, but not really um, living by these, these principles. So, you know, in, in tech circles, people love saying things like, you know, fail early, fail often. I'm like, well, let, let's not keep failing. I think um, <laughs> what, what Doug might be encouraging is, you know, um, if, if, if failure is an option and if we're going to learn from 
mistakes that lead to failures and really have lessons learned. It's those small misses, right? We need to fail early and fail small as a way to prevent the big failures, right? So instead of fail early, fail often, maybe it's more like fail early, succeed later as a result. I I like it. It is fail early, fail often, but I think that's a better way of looking at it. I like that. Doug, Doug, thank you. Professor Shear, thank you for jumping in there. We've got a question from John Thompson, another recent author, uh, uh, How to Be an Ace in Business and Life. He has a question about how the heck did you get your uh, LinkedIn audience so big, Benny? (laughs) I have really, I have to thank LinkedIn for that because they um, were very, they've been very kind to me. And I don't know if this is, I don't think this is a repeatable process where they early on in what they were calling their LinkedIn influencers program, they invited me to be a part of that. They now call this um, top voices. And, um, you know, their criteria early on was you, you had to be a published author. And I, I got picked and, and uh, tapped on the shoulder to be one of the healthcare industry um, top voices. So they aggressively recommend, you know, that, that people follow me. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't think there's a process where you can apply to be um, part of that. So, I mean, I'd like to think some of it is what I've I've done to sort of try to build or at least keep those followers or, you know, encouraging others. So a lot of it, I think, is just the the result of that gift from LinkedIn. And then I think some of it is trying to take good advantage of that gift by sharing, you know, content that's um, interesting or thought provoking or, or helpful in some way. Well put. There you go, JT3, buddy. That's the secret. Uh, Mark was an early adopter when there was, you know, much uh, and and then leaned into it. So well done on yeah. you taking advantage of uh, the opportunity there. Uh, so let's dive over into the rapid fire questions mm-hmm. here. We'll wrap it up in just a couple of minutes here, Mark. This is my favorite part. Mm-hmm. You, you ready to go? Rapid fire? Let's do it. Favorite sandwich? Favorite sandwich. I don't eat a lot of sandwiches. I'm trying to avoid bread. Well, <laughs> it, it's maybe we, people will debate this all day long in the chat. Is a taco a sandwich? <laughs> uh, I, huge I, taco I, I'm, in, I'm in Texas. I love, let's say, um, a, a beef fajita taco. Nice. We, we do a lot of Taco Tuesdays around this household. <laughs> uh, favorite color? Favorite color? Purple. Um, I, I, I went to Northwestern University. The Wildcats and school mm-hmm. color is purple. So I ended up with a lot of purple clothing. I love purple. Shout out to the Big Ten. I went to Wisconsin undergrad. <laughs> uh, favorite vacation spot? Oh, boy. Um, I'll, I'll say Scotland. Like I've, I've been fortunate to be able to go visit um, Scotland a couple of times, including a couple of tours to um, distilleries in a couple of different regions, uh, Speyside and, and Isla. Uh, it's a pretty magical place. Um, so, so hello to anybody who is watching there in Scotland. Uh, Mark also has a podcast that uh, celebrates the brown water, I think it's called. Uh- <laughs> well, that, uh, water of life is back to some of the origin of, of the word whiskey, whether you believe that to be true or not. Water of life. Yeah. <laughs> Jason is uh, going, ahead, going ahead and disagreeing with you here. Taco is not a sandwich. Uh, I'm going to have to agree with you, Jason. Is a quesadilla it. a sandwich? Maybe that's more like a sandwich than a taco. <laughs> Uh, to stir things up. (laughs) I love it. And now I'm going to go to, uh, Jason was on the show a couple of months ago when his book came out in relationship to infinity and maybe had one of the best answers to this question. Scariest animal, Mark. Oh gosh. When when I lived in Phoenix, scorpions, Mm. I never got stung by one, but when you, when you hear of like, it's not only a matter of don't step on a scorpion, but that a scorpion could climb the wall and fall into your bed at night. That was terrifying. Mm. And I had a friend of mine I worked with who who got stung. We're talking about learning from mistakes. Hey, Blake, if you're watching um, <laughs> twice, he, he had a pool in his backyard and he grabbed the towel and threw it around his back. And there was a scorpion hiding in there and it stung him. How? Two different times. How? <laughs> <laughs> Shanna, thanks for sticking up for Mark here. Appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's awesome. It, it, Jason's was uh, hyena, by the way. He, he knows more about hyenas than anyone I've ever met. Uh, first and, concert and you J- went to. J- well, Jason was a guest on My Favorite Mistake, too, by the way. And his story is is featured in the book. So shout out to Jason. Oh, nice. Uh, for, first concert I ever went to. The first concert like, I ever went to like without parents, like with friends. Um, it was, oh, okay. Yeah. I think it was senior year in high school seeing Sting in, in playing Detroit. I think Joe Lewis Arena. Very cool. I think, I think for me, it was Steve Miller. Uh, last photo on your phone. Oh gosh. Um, 
rather than make it up or lie, let me, <laughs> let me look. Um, it's actually a photo I took of a, uh, an easel pad from a, a workshop I facilitated on Wednesday. How boring is that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're out there doing it, buddy. You're out yeah. there working. Uh, what is one thing you own that you should really get rid of? One thing that I own that I should really get rid of. Uh, oh, pfft. Okay, in, in, in that cabinet in the bookshelf behind me is the box full of old cables and chargers that I refuse <laughs> to untangle and take to electronics recycling. That's that. Yeah, I should do that this weekend. <laughs> I have a similar box in my basement somewhere. Yeah, I, think we uh, I might need that cable someday. Right. It's, no, get... Apple is not going back to the old <laughs> wide adapter. Get rid of it. <laughs> I probably have 40 miles of boat coaxial cable down there too, for some reason. You might need uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yes, you get ready to sign all these books for your, uh, your uh, uh, pre-sale folks. Well, have you ever asked anyone for their autograph? Um, I, I do. Like, so I've, in my travels, I've run across a lot of, um, you know, famous people on planes or airports. And, and I try not to, you know, I try not to bother anybody, but I did have an opportunity um, recently, uh, pre-show, Bare Naked Ladies, um, concert. There was kind of meet, meet and greet opportunity. I did ask their drummer, Tyler Stewart, uh, for an autograph and, 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 and he did so. And I mean, I, I, I'll, everyone in the band is great, but I, I play drums. And so of anyone in the band, I'm like, Hey, Tyler, sometimes the drummer doesn't get a lot of attention. So I asked, he signed. Um, so I'm happy. I'm happy. I asked. I'm happy. He did it. <laughs> was he surprised? Hey, someone wants my autograph. What's going <laughs> I think on a here? little bit. A little bit, uh, but um, he appreciated it. I did want to read, you had an amazing quote for your book I want to share with our listeners here real quick from mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. famous author, Daniel Pink. I've read mm -hmm. a few of his books now, and I wanted to share this with our listeners. I know Jason Levin also had a great quote from him for his book. Yeah. Uh, Dan Pink, uh, on your book, The Mistakes That Make Us, at last, a book about errors, flubs, and screw-ups that pushes beyond platitudes and actually shows us how to enlist our mistakes as engines of learning, growth, and progress. Dive into the mistakes that make us and discover secrets to nurturing psychological safety. A, a psychologically safe environment that encourages the small experiments that lead to big breakthroughs. That is awesome. How'd that feel to get that from Mr. Pink? That that was, well, it's exciting and scary to ask somebody for an endorsement and you hope they're going to like the book. Um, Dan has been um, exceedingly kind to me doing an endorsement for a previous book, Measures of Success. And, you know, I, I had a fellow a Northwestern alum uh, who was a classmate of Dan's introduced me to him. So there's, there's a bit of a Northwestern connection, but I, I'd like to think he didn't just write the blurb because of my purple clothing that I often wear. I, I, so I, I, I appreciate Dan taking the time, you know, to, to, to lend, you know, such a nice endorsement like that. And I've been a big fan of Dan's books. He's been a guest on My Favorite Mistake and uh, his book, The Power of Regret. We talked about how you know, mistakes can lead to regret. There's, there's kind of good connections. So I, I hope people will check out his books. Uh, that book is sitting right here, uh, Power <laughs> of Regret, yeah, right behind my head here. I love that yeah. one. Uh, a couple of questions here, and then we'll uh, wrap it up here. Um, what would you say to those thinking about writing a book? I mean, I'd, I'd say for one, you know, go do it. I mean, there there is an infinite amount of shelf space on Amazon, which is both, you know, good that you can. Look, there's room for your book. You know, everyone has, I think, their own unique stories and perspectives where they can write a book. It doesn't have to be an incredibly long, intimidating book um, that, you know, and, and I think, you know, um, so there's a lot of competition out there for books with that infinite shelf space. But I think, you know, to, to write a book, use it as a calling card, use it as a way to share ideas and stories that are meaningful to you. I think the process of writing a book even if it doesn't sell a ton of copies, I've always said, like, I think if you're going about it in an iterative, inquisitive way, like if, if you want to learn more about a subject, take a subject you think you know something about and start writing a book about it. And you'll you'll end up learning more along the way. So um, I, I would say, yeah, go do it. Um, you know, go find a coach. You don't have to do it alone. I would encourage people, you know, find an editor or have an editorial board. I intentionally nowadays, I write my books in Google Docs because it's easier for other people to come in and look and add comments. And, you know, I think, you know, don't again, like don't don't go into your book cave and, and just write a book in secrecy and then try to launch it into the world. I mean, I think try to you know, whether you're hiring people to help or you have, you know, advisors, um, 
let let people read, give you feedback and, and iterate in a way that makes the book better. Right. You can't wait till it goes on Amazon to start talking about it. And you've done a brilliant uh, job of this, promoting it over the last number of weeks. And so excited for you, Mark. And congratulations. Uh, how would you describe your writing journey in five words? Uh, yeah, you, you let me think about this in advance, which is good. So I would just say, be ready to iterate often. <laughs> I love that one. I'm reminding myself of that. Don't be hard on yourself when you're like, oh, I didn't write it perfectly the first time. Well, like nobody ever does. And then just the other random tip. And I try to remind myself this, like at some point, stop thinking about what you're going to write and put fingers to the keyboard, start writing. And then that's what, you know, that's what editing is for. You can't edit a blank page, can you? Don't uh, try to write a perfect first draft. No one it, ever does. I don't it's think. no first no first draft manuscript has ever been published, right? And uh, don't publish your first draft. That's probably a mistake too. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, closing thoughts for our listeners, my friend. Um, well, you know, I want to thank everybody who um, you know who's tuned in today. Um, you know, thank everyone who's who's been encouraging and helpful along the way. Um, John, you've been very generous with your time, just as uh, you know, a, a fellow author, we, you know, we've become friends from doing the podcast. And, you know, so I appreciate your generosity and, and not just giving feedback, but organizing um, this session here today. Um, so I, I, I hope people will remember, maybe I'll, I'll answer um, the question one other way. So I've got this coffee mug here with the logo, but then the side I'm looking at has some reminders and mantras that sort of, you know, um, came to be through the course of doing the podcast and reflecting on it. So I'll just read what's on the mug here. And I read it to remind myself these things. Um, be kind to yourself. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. The important thing is continuing to learn from our mistakes. So, so key. I love that. And I love having that mug in my uh, kitchen cabinet. Uh, and, and, and Dennis, I'm going to send you a mug. <laughs> Uh, and I would encourage everyone to drop their favorite uh, mistake in the chat here, and we can uh, we'll have some little com comments with that uh, as we as this will go posted on LinkedIn and YouTube here mm -hmm. as soon as we hang up in just a, a minute or two here. But uh, Mark, Ben, thank you for your kind words there. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and, and become friends with you over the last year or two, and certainly be a, uh, on your show. I think I was episode one forty five. Now you're at like two fifteen. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll put the link to your episode in in the chat there. And um, yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Please do well. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks for sharing your story here. Congratulations on your new book. Thanks, uh, thanks to all our listeners out there for joining this episode of Meet the Author Live. Definitely go check out Mark's new book, The Mistakes That Make Us, Cultivating a Culture of Learning and Innovation, wherever you buy books online. And you can learn more about him and his podcast at markgraben.com. I'm your host, John Saunders. Keep making mistakes out there, but make sure you learn from them. Thanks there for joining everybody. Thanks, John. Thanks.